Hey, welcome to the show. Today, we're going to talk about PolySign. This is a sister company to Ripple and is going to play a massively important role in our next financial system. So stay tuned. Hey, welcome to the show. This is Molly Elmore. Today, we're going to talk about PolySign. Uh, I bought some private equity yesterday for PolySign, and I realized I hadn't done a video on it. I've done a thread, and I wanted to take some time to explain why I think this project, this business, is so massively important for the digital asset, assets ecosystem. I just want to explain a little bit of how it works and sort of what I see as the long-term vision uh, for PolySign and how it fits into essentially our next financial system. So when it comes to buying cryptocurrencies or tokens or any type of digital asset, there's a, there's a big problem that the industry hasn't sort of officially solved at scale yet. And that has to do with custody of the asset. And this is very different than kind of any other way that we've traditionally transacted using the internet. Uh, and that if I buy something through the blockchain, buy a digital asset, I literally kind of own it. I, it lives on the blockchain, but I own it in the sense that I have these keys to it, this sort of ability to access it, and I can resell it or give it away or whatever. But if I'm not diligent and protective of this asset, it could be taken from me. And most of the hacks that, you know, sort of the, the theft problems that have happened in crypto are generally a result of somebody taking somebody else's digital asset because it wasn't secure. A lot of times these happen at bridges when values being moved from one blockchain to another, but it addresses this sort of key problem, which is if I'm a company, let's say, or person, and I buy a bunch of digital assets, how do I keep them safe? How do I protect them from being stolen or taken or whatever? And so we refer to this idea as custody uh, and the idea of taking ownership of these assets is really important. Okay. PolySign is a sister company to Ripple. And it was created by sort of a, the same team that was involved in Ripple. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and they essentially, in a nutshell, are focused on institutional custody. And I'm going to read some things that are sort of from their website and articles about them just to set the context about why this is such a big deal. So PolySign developed, started the state-of-the-art, secure, scalable infrastructure for, for financial institutions to fully leverage their digital assets. So PolySign isn't really targeting you and me. It is targeting financial institutions, which means banks, which means you know hedge funds, which means um, any kind of company that goes out and buys a whole bunch of assets like stocks and bonds on behalf of clients and needs to keep those things safe. So if you are invested in an IRA or a 401k, or even if you were to use a company like E-Trade, you know, those assets that are kind of bought on your behalf need to be kept somewhere secure. And if the industry wants to have the big boys, you know, the large investment companies like Fidelity on board, there needs to be some kind of official way that this is done in a way that it's regulated, it complies with the laws of every nation, so that nobody's like risking, you know, a pension fund or someone's retirement account with something that's not regulated. I you know as of recording this, we're sort of still in the aftermath of the FTX collapse and the Ontario Teachers Fund, the sort of their pension was kind of caught up in that. And what's going to probably come out is that those assets were not being custodied properly. They were either lent out or <laughs> leveraged in some way which means that 
it was just too high of a risk for something like a pension fund to get involved in. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what PolySign has done. Um, so PolySign has a couple of subsidiaries as well that are specifically targeting this custody uh, issue. Because I mean, here's sort of the idea. Like if, if I were to go out and buy, you know, 100 Bitcoin and I want to keep my Bitcoin safe, I can get a wallet. I can use a wallet on my phone or I could be even more diligent and get a cold wallet which is you know, essentially a small piece of hardware that the access to my tokens is stored on. Because remember, the tokens all live on the blockchain. Is it really feasible or realistic for a hedge fund who buys like $100 million worth of something to keep all of that on some little plastic device that an employee is tasked with keeping track of? Are you really going to secure this massive amount of value through someone's like 12 word seed phrase. It's just not realistic for the consumer solutions like cold wallets to be implemented for something very wide scale like institutional investing. So what I think the industry did was they looked to, well, what is, you know, what does the current financial system do to keep assets safe? And they have these entities called custodians and they, um, they're kind of regulated by the banking industry and Ripple, uh, sorry, uh, PolySign has created or uh, has a subsidiary called Standard Custody and Trust. And this was actually licensed in New York, which is key because you know Wall Street's in New York, a lot of very large financial institutions in the world and certainly in the US are based out of New York. And they got um, this charter from New York State in order to act as a sub custodian for New York regulated banks. So think about the banks like JP Morgan, who you know invests on behalf of their clients, they need to have these assets custodied. And so for PolySign to be licensed in New York means that it can work with those large Wall Street banks. Uh, the industry is going through a major change right now, kind of in the wake of a series of collapses, Luna, Celsius, sorry, Terra, Luna, Celsius, and most recently FTX. And it looks like we're kind of on this cusp where these sort of very consumer focused projects are probably going to go away, the majority of them. Um, and those that remain will probably serve a broader audience, including the institutional market. Uh, and PolySign has said that we had a lot to learn from this recent era of crypto. And one of the most valuable pieces of technology, it's almost more of a concept, but is the, the DeFi protocols where you can trade assets between two parties without counterparty risk and without having to do it like during certain times of the day and without having to wait days to settle it. Like it is pretty revolutionary how that technology works. And I think Reggie Middleton, hopefully he'll get paid for all of his contributions to this space because if the entire globe starts to trade assets like stocks and bonds using DeFi, I mean, that's all because of his creation is, is from what I understand. All right, because think about it. If you trade stocks right now, there's a whole team of people in the background who have to uh, track down who's paid what, make sure everybody's kind of billing went through and that the, the payment settled. And what do you do if one guy's check bounced or whatever, or something didn't clear? following up on that, what if that kind of went away and the settlement happened instantly? There would be no more risk because if I go and sell you a stock and it takes three days to figure out that you're not good for it, that's three days that I could have sold it to somebody else and you know, I'm not gonna get the money now. And that's what counterparty risk is, is sort of this idea that there's risk on one, one or both sides of the transaction that's not gonna go through. And right now in a lot of these institutional financial trades, it can take days for that to, to for them to figure that out. So this would massively solve that problem. And I, if you want to check out my previous videos on things like Project Guardian, um, those kind of covered and Project Ion that sort of covered the institutional financial world, leveraging blockchain for settling these transactions so that they go through more quickly and there isn't this counterparty risk. And so if we take the great things about what we've learned the last couple of years in sort of what we call crypto and apply those to financial services, but do it in a way that 
these assets are not risked, you know, at risk of getting hacked or stolen, that's going to be a massive step forward for the financial services industry. So this idea of custody is not new. And back in the day, it involved literally a physical vault. So originally a custodian's role was to maintain a physical vault where it would keep its client security certificates and any paperwork related to ownership of other assets until they were sold or needed to be transferred to the custodian of the new owner. So these were just the people who made sure that you, know, you didn't lose your stock certificate or didn't burn down in your house or didn't get lost, you know, stolen from you. It's a whole bunch of things that could have happened to it. So you had this third party who wasn't really involved in the transaction necessarily. They weren't the seller or the buyer. They just acted almost kind of like an escrow idea where this independent entity just holds the assets in a very secure place. And even today, where things aren't even being done with paper certificates anymore, like if you buy a stock kind of using the internet, like E-Trade or something, today's custodians hold assets on behalf of customers or in the digital world, they take a deposit or collateral against the value of the asset. And they keep it secure until the uh, asset owner wants to trade, move, stake, or lend it. And at that time, the custodian also plays an important role in coordinating the associate transactions with respective counterparties. So when you go to sell your stock currently, and this paper certificate or some sort of proof of ownership exists somewhere with this custodian, if I go and sell it, then the custodian takes care of making sure it goes to the new owner. So there's a pretty important role in this because, you know, I can give you the money to buy something, but we have to make sure that the actual asset itself is transferred to the new owner. And that's part of this custody idea. So at Standard Custody, which is a subsidiary of PolySign, we have innovated beyond the primary custodial function. Our business model is focused on providing institutions with custody, which we just covered, escrow, which is kind of like this third party thing, and settlement services in the digital asset transaction cycle. Now, the settlement services is where XRP can come in and be the actual token that is used to settle that transaction. Not only have we built the most secure, scalable, and user-friendly solutions to safeguard clients' digital assets, we are the only custodian that has built a custom blockchain running inside the industry standard hardware security modules called HSMs. You can think of HSMs as the secret keeper with the sole purpose of controlling access to your digital assets secrets. Our proprietary computing ensures these secrets are always sharded the result is the one and only solution that operates in near real time with the market backed by the immutability of the blockchain. So if you've listened to any other um, kind of content creators who talk about XRP a lot, like Digital Asset Investor, uh, Digital Asset Investor and Brad Kimes, they uh, will often <laughs> talk about PolySign in this sort of secretive, whispery voice. It's kind of a little bit of a joke that uh, there's not much public disclosure around PolySign. And if you were to, if I were to hypothesize as to why I think that is the case, it's not that it's a secret what PolySign does. My guess is that how they do it is a secret. And that's sort of the key. That's why the team involved in PolySign is so important to know who they are and the patents they have filed, which I'm not going to claim to fully understand all of the technical jargon in there. But I think it lies with this idea that they have come up with a very unique way to keep your access secret on the blockchain. So you don't have to store it physically in someone's like device, like a cold wallet. Or I don't have to store something on my computer that could get hacked or stolen. It's being stored in some way in the blockchain in a way that it's encoded. That's my hypothesis from my research about why I think this is sort of revolutionary is that it's very different than the current solution of using kind of a wallet and a password that a person knows, but I might be wrong about that. Okay. Uh, PolySign has also gone to great lengths to be compliant with the rules. You know, if you followed Ripple at all, they, you know, they go to a lot of world banking events, their clients are central banks, they go to the Davos things, they are playing along, they're not anti-banking or anti-fiat even, they're just looking for ways to solve the painful and expensive problem that a lot of these institutions have, which is it can take a long time to settle transactions, 
It can take a long time. It can be expensive to settle them. And in this case, custodying of digital assets is a, is a problem. And no large hedge fund or 401k or whatever mutual fund is going to incorporate digital assets unless they have an amazingly secure way to keep those uh, assets safe. And the travel rule kind of ties into the fact that when you are making transactions across borders, that you know who your, the transactions are between. It kind of ties into this anti-money anti laundering KYC type of framework. And PolySign is very clear that they're part of this thing called trust. It was designed to overcome the challenges of applying the travel rule to virtual currency transactions while ensuring the security and privacy of customer information and other sensitive data. The travel rule raises challenges for virtual currency transactions in part because of the decentralized nature of blockchain technology through which these transactions are conducted. So, you know, if I send you money from my XRP wallet to your XRP wallet, we don't have, you know, nobody has to know about that. But if you want to get these institutional investors involved, they're going to want to follow these KYC anti-money laundering processes because they have regulations in their country that they have to honor. The travel rule requires financial institutions, including non-banks. So a non-bank is like a hedge fund or you know, an E-Trade or that kind of thing. They're not banks. To share financial information about their customers when sending funds to other another financial institution above a certain dollar amount. So I think this is primarily done for money laundering purposes and transparency. So PolySign is playing by the rules, including the travel rule. Trust is a flexible global solution that enables travel rule compliance. And they are addressing some of these sort of privacy rules and security rules. And essentially they're just making sure that they honor and adopt all the frameworks that are currently in place with these financial institutions and so that they can be used and adopted without any of these barriers. All right, so there's a couple of things around custody that PolySign mentions as sort of a big deal. And if you uh, study, I don't, I'm not a Coinbase user, but I'm aware that they have a custody solution for their clients. And PolySign makes the case that an exchange shouldn't be offering custody because there's kind of a conflict of interest. While some exchanges have also built custody solutions, and I think they're talking about Coinbase in this case, we believe digital asset custody for institutions should be separate from trading on exchanges. Call us old school, but we believe this age-old conflict-free segregation of duty will ultimately accrue to the benefit of all investors and provide for an efficient and orderly market. SEC Chairman Gensler seems to agree. I think this is why they created a separate company for PolySign and don't, doesn't, don't have it as just part of Ripple. That if PolySign is truly this absolutely separate independent company, separate you know legal structure, separate management team, separate bank accounts, et cetera, and all they do is custody, then there isn't going to be this conflict of interest with other parts of the business. So it seems uh, logical that that's why it's set up so separately. Uh, segregated accounts, similar idea well, regarding the risk with some exchanges, and this is kind of what happened with FTX, is that exchanges generally keep clients' assets in an omnibus account, leaving client assets at risk in the case of an insolvency. At standard custody, all of our clients' accounts are segregated. We're entrusted with keeping our customers' assets secure at all costs and will never commingle them with another client's assets to achieve any ulterior motive or business interest, as noted in our New York Trust Charter. So a lot of exchanges, the way they make money is they take assets that you buy as a customer and they go and lend them out or stake them for interest for a term. The problem is, is that what if the person they lend them to doesn't pay them back uh, and they become insolvent? So institutional uh, business, like institutional investors don't want to play that game because it's just not worth the risk for them, especially when they're talking about huge amounts of money. So if PolySign isn't in the lending business and they're not in the staking business and they're not in the exchanging of assets business, the only thing they do is custody assets, then there's little to no risk that they're going to lose them because that's not what they do. They only do this one thing. And then there's a little bit more about this security, which I think is the key to why PolySign 
is differentiated in the market versus uh, essentially what um, Coinbase does or even some other competitors. I honestly haven't really studied too much of the other competitors in this space because I don't, I know who the team is for PolySign and I've, I'm very confident they are going to be best in class. And I don't want to get into the techie stuff because I don't fully understand it, to be honest, but they have this idea where there's a zero trust model where everything is automated. All of the essential information is on a, on a private blockchain encrypted by the master key to this cluster. No human being ever has access to this stuff. They're all geographically distributed, supported by different colo providers ensuring no single point of failure. So it looks like they've gone to great lengths to sort of figure out what are all the things that could go wrong and address all of those. All right, this is some, now this is where the team thing gets a little bit interesting. So the C-Levels uh, team is led by Jack McDonald, who kind of has a history of, you know, resume in banking, your typical kind of money guy, uh, great spokesman on a lot of podcasts. And then there's sort of two technical people involved who created the software. David Schwartz, who if you are familiar with Ripple, uh, CTO of Ripple as well, very involved in PolySign, uh, you know, well-known guy in the crypto space because very active on Twitter, has a good sense of humor and likes to share somewhat cryptic, uh, almost riddle-like posts with people that we have great fun trying to decode and decipher. The more interesting character, in my opinion, is Arthur Brito, who's also early involvement in Ripple and has really chosen to remain anonymous in this industry. It's very difficult to find photos. Uh, I did spend some time digging to it. I think I have found some. I don't know if it necessarily matters. He chooses to remain anonymous for a reason, which is why, and he's very smart. The people who do know him speak very, very highly of his technical acumen and intelligence and all that stuff. Uh, and so if somebody were going to be capable of building kind of a world-class security solution to keep digital assets safe, my money would be on Arthur Brito to be able to do that. There is much speculation that he is part of the Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto team, which uh, I think makes a lot of sense because we don't know who that is. Uh, and because his interest in being uh, anonymous, it kind of fits into that's why he would do it. He's not interested in the glory or the uh, celebrity status that the founder of Bitcoin would have. Uh, and it, what I just find even just amusing is that you, know, you go to the PolySign website, it's very corporate-like, which you would expect, uh, very appropriate and professional looking, and everyone has sort of their headshot, and they just have nothing for Arthur Bruno. I don't know if I've ever seen a a website where they list the founder team and everyone has a photo except one guy. It's just, it's kind of funny that I, he's got some sway that he says, no, I don't want my photo on there. And it's not there. Uh, PolySign also does own a, another company called MG Stover, which is a digital asset fund administrator. And what kind of got interesting when you're digging into this and trying to figure out sort of what's, what's the sort of long-term agenda behind the whole Ripple ecosystem? It's interesting that George Soros and his fund are investors in this. I'm not really a fan of George Soros. I don't think he's a good guy. Um, if you watch my video about um, Sam Bankman-Fried and his effective altruism uh, movement that he's a part of, these sort of charitable extremely wealthy people often act like they care about humanity. But if you dig really into their agenda, it's actually quite dark and almost evil. And George Soros has a strong reputation for being one of these guys who kind of pretends he's this philanthropist. But if you dig into it, he really does serve a darker agenda, generally around feudalism, depopulation, and other ways to sort of harm the vast majority of people to the benefit of you know his crowd. So it was, I think, surprising to learn that Soros is, and I've known this for a while, that they're in, invested in and part of it. And Ripple does go to these Davos events. So in no way is any of this anti-banking or anti-establishment or even anti-kind of financial elite. And it does 
Uh, if you've seen any of my posts or videos around kind of Tom Luongo's thesis that there's this sort of battle between the Davos crowd and the Wall Street crowd, and we know about the lawsuit between Ripple and the SEC, it, it's kind of interesting that this might be part of it and that Ripple is kind of part of Team Davos and JP Morgan is part of Team Wall Street and the intent was Wall Street wanted to control the payment sector. And so they created this lawsuit to sort of slow Ripple down. Um, I don't know. We'll see how that comes out. That's also sort of known as ETHgate. It's its own very interesting rabbit hole that I actually do have a separate video on. I can put some of these links in the show notes or the description if you like. Um, but it does tie into the fact that there is a big picture agenda here. And there's probably going to be amazing things about this. But there are also some dystopian concerns that hopefully we don't have to worry about. So digging more into this PolySign thing. Yeah, this is a very different company than something like FTX or whatever, because they have a series of patents that have been worked on for a long time, for several years. And it does show you that they are serious about building code that is revolutionary. And um, I wasn't really interested in reading the patents so much as I was just looking really more about who are the names of the people on the patents. And uh, they do have quite a bit of language around recording data in a distributed ledger, which I think has to do with this system. They have to keep the access keys secret on the ledger. So they have to sort of have a way to store things up there in a way that is accurate, secure, whatever. So I'm just sort of making some assumptions here because I don't fully know, understand the whole tech side around this. But I was more interested, as I said, in who is on these. And we saw some names here. So David Schwartz and Arthur Britter are on here. There were some other names. Um, there is one in a different thing I wanted to talk about. They did have several patents. Oh, and this one. So there's a guy named Sam Feinberg who shows up on a couple of things. And when I dug into this rabbit hole of who are the names on these patents, I kind of ended up in two different places. One is that Arthur Brito and this Sam Feinberg were submitting patents around blockchain before Bitcoin was even created. So it does kind of feed into this thesis that they were in this industry and around at early enough that they could have had a role in it. And that's fine. It's, that's cool. But I was like, well, where, what were they doing job wise, career wise back then? that would sort of feed into this larger picture about where this whole thing is going. And I'm kind of going to deviate a little bit away from PolySign specifically and just trying to figure out more about Arthur Brito. Uh, and when I got into some of these patents, they tied back to HP, to Hewlett Packard, which I thought was interesting. Cause I don't, I guess I don't really associate HP with blockchain stuff. I certainly never associated them with Bitcoin. But that was where this Samuel Feinberg worked. And so Arthur Brito is on here too. And the, the address for both of these guys with this patent around sort of filing, storing stuff on the filing system, which is kind of what the blockchain is, right? It's like a database in the cloud for all intents and purposes. So if you're storing chunks of data up there, these two guys were on there and HP was sort of listed as the address. Uh, okay. I think I got some of these out of order. So yeah, this is Sam Feinberg dug into him a little bit. And not only did he work at HP, but it goes back to NASA. And I started to find all of a sudden a lot of these connections between NASA and Arthur Brito. Cause look at this. Arthur Brito has a NASA LinkedIn page. There's nothing on there. Why create it? Like, I don't get it. Like, I always find it strange when somebody creates a LinkedIn page and it's just it's totally empty. It's like, what was the point of that? And again, he wants to rename, remain anonymous. Somebody might have created this on his behalf. That's possible. Nobody says he had to have done it. But it, I was just like, wow, okay. So now we're tying this back to NASA, which, you know, if you've dug into the theories and thesis behind who created Bitcoin, who is around it. There are a lot of connections back to the US government in some way, whether that's a group like DARPA, 
or the NSA or NASA. I'm not totally clear because I don't even know the relationship between those organizations, like whether they're friends with each other or rivals or whatnot. But I did find it interesting that I found quite a few ties to NASA. And an interesting something somebody posted somewhere where Satoshi Nakamoto is a Japanese name. And in Japan, when you say your name, you don't do it the way we do in the West, where you say first name and then last name. In Japan, they say last name and then first name. So if you were to say Satoshi Nakamoto in Japan, you would say it as Nakamoto Satoshi. And N-A, Nakamoto, Satoshi, S-A, is NASA. I thought that was kind of funny. Because I have seen this other uh, thesis before where they take the names of a couple Japanese companies like Samsung, et cetera. Actually, Samsung is not Japanese. Maybe it's so, I don't know. Where they've taken like Nakamoto and broken it out into these sort of Japanese manufacturing companies. It always seemed a little bit strange, but this other kind of alternative way of doing Nakamoto Satoshi and that being NASA. And then they worked at NASA. I, I don't know. I'm not sure what to make of that, but I thought that was kind of interesting. And then this kind of ties back to Jed McCaleb. So founder got of Ripple, left and created Stellar. He's another sort of character we don't know that much about. While there certainly are pictures of him, he's not exactly like David Schwartz active on Twitter all day long. And sure enough, when I was reading some more stuff about Jed, his father and mother both worked at NASA. What are the odds of that? And Jed McCaleb has since sort of left Stellar, and now he is creating a space station for people to live on. Uh, and he's self-funding it. And when I dug into who all the people are who, um, we'll get into that in a second, hold on. So back to Jed and NASA. So as I was reading these articles that he has plans on probably connecting this project with NASA. Uh, and he let, said in one of his interviews that I read that NASA has laid out its plan to decommission and deorbit the International Space Station by 2031, signaling a chance for commercial businesses to step in and provide replacement facilities. So if there were to be a transition between the current space station, which I don't even really know what goes on there, and this new one, it would imply that there is a connection between Jed McCaleb and NASA. It's unclear where vast funding for the space project is coming from. But, you know, Jed McCaleb has a lot of money, but to build a space station is a lot of money. So I don't know if he's going to use all of it. We'll see. He did say in the article that he wasn't eager to take on investors. And I don't know if I have the screen share of it, but um, there was another clip that I had. Maybe it's this thing. Oh, yeah. Where an interviewer asked him when he was being interviewed about Vast. So you're self-funded for now. Why or when would that change? I mean, do you anticipate competing for NASA or other government contracts? And Jed replied, we definitely want to serve NASA and maybe other national astronaut programs. Are there more? I don't know. I think one of the reasons why there are so many people building space stations right now, which was actually news to me, I didn't know that, is because NASA has this CLD program happening. So we certainly want to compete for that. And I think we're a really good fit for what they're looking for. So yes, it does tie in back to NASA. Arthur Brito's worked at NASA. The Sam Feinberg guy worked at NASA. Uh, now there sort of comes back to NASA in more ways. Um, and then the other thing that was sort of interesting is that when you look at VAST, so they're hiring like crazy. So they're aggressively growing from what I can tell. And they're all based out of California, LA. When I started to look up the people who work there now, like 95% of the people who work at VAST, which is Jed McCaleb's space station company, all come from SpaceX. Now, why they're not just doing this at SpaceX, I have no idea. Why they've all left and come to this company is very interesting, but it does imply there is this connection between SpaceX and Vast. And I have, I don't know where it came from, but I did read that Jed McCaleb and Elon Musk are friends. They're part of this sort of billionaire techie crowd. So it doesn't surprise me. It's just sort of interesting. And it was quite a few of these employees who um, used to work at SpaceX and now work at. And what do you know? 
One of them, who's named Molly, not me, she also has connections with working with NASA. So like we're all sort of tied back into this interesting thesis that uh, this next, <laughs> if you watch my video about the occult in XRP, one of the sort of things that gets very interesting when you dig into some of these Riddlers who like to talk about some of the more difficult to prove things around XRP is these ties to it being this interplanetary currency and that we're going to use XRP and potentially stellar to trade and transact with other people or whatever on other planets. I mean, that still sounds crazy saying that out loud, but it is kind of funny now that here we go. The, one of the founders of Ripple, one of the founders of X, creators of XRP, creator of stellar, has now gone to work in a space related project where he wants us to go live on a space station. In one of the articles, they're going to do manufacturing of things on these space stations. He said, it isn't going to be just some luxury hotel where people go and hang out. Like I want this to be a new economy up in space. Well, if you're going to manufacture stuff, you might need to sell those things. And it kind of ties into this interesting theory that this is all being done for this interplanetary trade and travel and sure enough we start to see more connections to that which isn't necessarily tied directly to polysign but it goes back to arthur brito and his connections and sort of what's the big the big picture here so i don't have all the answers on that i just found that to be a pretty fascinating uh rabbit hole but back to polysign and why i think polysign is as significant a company in the digital asset space as any other one, if not more, is that there's a belief that everything will be tokenized in the future. When we talk about everything, we obviously are talking about money, but we're also talking about energy. So if you know anything about carbon credits, that's kind of that. Then real estate would be tokenized. So right now when you have a deed that says you own real estate, that would be a token, an NFT probably. You could even have a fractional ownership in real estate. Stocks and bonds, obviously, those are pretty clear candidates to move to the blockchain fairly soon. We've also seen that the gold industry is talking about tokenized gold, which is a different way. Now, the um, climate change group run out of the UN who are pushing these things called the Sustainable Development Goals. If you dig into what that's really all about is they want to tokenize natural resources like water, air, land, even not necessarily just real estate, but all sort of the planet, everything would be tokenized. And even humans, your identity, this is where digital ID comes into play, your identity would be tokenized. It would, you know, kind of like your birth certificate sort of living on the blockchain. You'd have some sort of official ID number and official ID paperwork, and that would be an NFT that is on the blockchain so that it couldn't be uh, copied or stolen or whatever. So you think about it, if everything in the world is tokenized, how do we keep these assets, these tokens secure? There has to be a system so that nobody's going to come along and steal your identity and steal all your gold and steal all your bond and steal all your real estate and all these things. And trust me, the very, very wealthy people who will own the majority of assets, they absolutely want to make sure that we don't come along and steal their stuff. So they, there has to be an incredibly secure way to make sure that everything that becomes tokenized is secure and safe on the blockchain. And that's what PolySign uh, is tackling, is the custody of everything, the custody of every tokenized asset, which right now is a very, very tiny microcosm of what is possible and what lays ahead. So that is why I got me some PolySign uh, private equity from Link2 the other day. And I don't have a lot, but I'm pretty excited about it. And we'll see how that goes in the future. But uh, this is why when people talk about utility and why, you know, some crypto projects are sort of more important than others, I would challenge you to look into what problem does a digital asset or a company that's using digital assets, what problem are they solving? And in this case, this issue of custody is a big deal. And it's not just about Dogecoin and Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's about everything being tokenized at some point. 
and having a way to keep all of those assets secure and safe so that they, you know, we don't have this hacking world going on where everything gets stolen all the time. So, all right. If you like this video, if you stayed all the way to the end, I appreciate it. Please like the video if you haven't yet. Subscribe my channel so you can see more videos in the future. And I would love to see you in my community where we talk about these types of things. Uh, it's called Two Steps Ahead. And the address is twostepsahead.locals.com. I'll put the link in the description. And I will see you in the next video. Take care.